Okay. So today we're going to continue talking about muscles. Um, but before we do that, I want to open up the room for questions at this point because this next topic we're we're getting into kind of requires us to all be on on the same page up until this point with, with what's going on with our muscles. And you can type or you can raise your hand and ask out loud. It's still still allowed. This is just a more anonymous option. <laughs> So I'll ask you specifically, I guess then, since I'm not seeing stuff coming in quite yet, um, this is what we talked about last time, at least with how the sarcomere works, makes sense, that sliding motion. Do you have any questions about that? Is that, is that working okay? Because we're about to explain like why that happens, like how we trigger that and, and what's going on in there. Okay. Anna? Okay, in that case, if questions come to you, obviously you can still ask, but I'm not seeing anything coming through just yet. So we're going to continue now by talking about the cross branch cycle. So last time we looked at the structure of the muscle, we've taken a look at how we get innervation to our skeletal muscle in the first place, right? So we have our motor neurons, the uh, neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine, our neurotransmitter being received by our nicotinic cholinergic receptors on the motor end plate, which we now know would be part of the outside part of our muscle cell. So on our sarcolemma is our renamed um, muscle fiber membrane. Okay? And we also know that within our muscle fiber, we have these bands of proteins um, made up of actin, composing something called our thin filament, and myosin, making up a thick filament. And the ways in which they overlap and connect to themselves create these little blocks, these little units that can shrink and shrink as they slide past each other which is why we have our sliding filament model, the filaments slide past each other. Overall, our end result of that is that the muscle fiber would get shorter in total, right? That muscle belly contracts, gets shorter, pulls on either end, those attachment points for our skeletal muscle. So that's the context for what we're thinking about as we talk about the cross bridge cycle. So now we're going to dive deep in and take a look at that actin and myosin and take a look at why and when they bind to each other and how that creates this movement, this sliding as we have contraction of the muscle. So that's the big picture point of the cross bridge cycle. This is kind of the mechanism by which we're going to be using energy in order to slide our filaments past each other and shrink, shrink the sarcomere. Okay. So it's gonna be a cycle. So we're gonna see a big loop of steps where we have actin and myosin getting linked together at their binding sites. And overall, our thin filaments, right? so our sarcomere is bounded by Z lines that connect all the actin to other thin filaments made of actin. 
All right, so we're gonna see those thin filaments sliding in towards the center. So sliding in towards the middle, middle is where we see the M line that connects all of our myosin, all of our thick filaments. Okay, so in order to have that happen, our myosin is gonna to have to grab the actin. That's gonna to have to pull it basically towards the center line. Okay? The way this works is gonna be kind of analogous to rowing a boat through the water. We're mentioning this largely because part of our cross bridge cycle, we have a step named for this, uh, this rowing motion, this rowing analogy. So we're gonna think about the heads of our myosin. So those like little golf club parts or those, those little kernels on our wheat shaft. We're gonna be thinking about them as ore paddles. So as we have the cross bridge cycle happening, we're going to be putting our ore down and contacting the water. All right, so we're hitting the water with our ore. So that's gonna be the binding of our myosin to the actin, right? So that's going to connect our filaments together. And then we're going to pull with our ore, right? So we're going to pull with our ore, moving through the water. And in this case, that's going to be the part where we're propelling the actin, propelling that thin filament towards the center of the muscle. Uh, so towards that M line. So this is like our ore movement, propelling the boat forward. Our thick filaments and thin filaments are then going to detach. So we're going to finish our stroke by lifting our ore out of the water. Okay? And then we're going to set up for our next stroke, right? So we're going to pull the ore around, give it some energy, and set up right so we can hit the water again and then pull it. So that's what's happening with our cross bridge cycle, but at a molecular level. Okay. Um, so reviewing just real quick that sarcomere shortening, I want you to click through. Uh, so we're, as we're having our sarcomere shorten, we have some regions that are, that are becoming smaller and some that are remaining unaffected. So this is just a little bit of sarcomere structure review. Okay, take another couple of seconds and we'll go through it. All right. Cool. All right. So we got a bunch of things happening. Looks pretty good. We had a couple of extra things checked off some of the time.
Uh, so, so let's run through. Okay. So when we're thinking about our sarcomere, right? We've got our actin. Uh, I'll use the same colors that's usually in those cartoons so you can match up. Okay. So we got our actin, which is our thin filament. It's connected through Z lines to other pieces of actin. Okay. And we've got that on both sides of the sarcomere. Okay. Cool. And we've got our thick filament, the myosin, in the center. And we'd have the M line running straight down the middle, attaching them to each other. Okay. So neither of these proteins physically become shorter when these filaments slide past each other. All that happens is that our areas of overlap change, right? So we just overlap them more, sliding those endpoints in when we want to contract our muscle. So that brings us to our zones. So neither the actin or the myosin, these thick or thin filaments are shortening, um, but regions of overlap are changing in size. Okay, oops. So, let's start with the A band. So the A band was just the area anywhere at all that we see that myosin, that thick filament. So because the myosin doesn't shorten, the A band also does not shorten. It's unaffected because it's just wherever we see that protein. So what we do see changing is the area of overlap, right? So the area where we have blue and orange both, if we cut across, and also the area of non-overlap, right? So if you slide closer together, that orange is gonna get closer and closer and closer to the Z line. So this is gonna shrink, right? So that's how we get these first two answers about the H band zone and the I band, because the H zone is that region of overlap here. So that region of overlap, oops, oops sorry, the H zone, sorry, <laughs> uh, was the region in the center. Du, du, du. H zone was the reason in the center shortening, and they overlap was right here, the remainder of the A band, right? So this is like A minus H. Yeah. The I band was this part where we have no overlap and just act it. Okay. So we have the two regions where we have no overlap, the H zone and the I band shrinking. The part where we have overlap is lengthening, therefore, because they're just trade-offs. And this is what's this is because that actin is moving towards the center. Now, the reason for this overall is that our two proteins are binding to each other, which is what we're about to talk about as we run through the steps of the crossbridge cycle. So this is to remind you that we have an actin binding site on myosin and we have a myosin binding site on actin that are gonna attach to each other. And if you wanna play around with shortening and lengthening sarcomeres, I gave you a copy of a Google slide with the pieces that you can just move around on your own and do it as many times as you want. So we have a big long explanation of what's happening. If you wanted to link that all together, everything that was in that statement to fully describe what's happening with the sarcomere shortening, you would say that the actin binding site on myosin binds to the myosin binding site on actin. Sliding the thin filament towards the center, this increases the region of overlap between the myosin and the actin, therefore shortening the H zone, which is the region where there's only myosin, and the I zone, the region where there's only actin. Okay. So I want you to take a look right now at the image of the cross bridge cycle that you'll have on the next slide. So the big circle thing. I want you to identify 
find that first step of the cross bridge cycle. And I want you to find what we have bound to myosin at that first step. So what is like our starting point for this cross bridge cycle? We're doing this because eventually all of these things are going to be involved in our understanding of how and why the muscle is contracting. Um, so it's worth it to pay careful attention to what's going on at each point in time. Okay, take another couple seconds. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, cool. So we're mostly looking at this pretty well. So during the first step, we're actually already set up to make our stroke of the oar. So we'll take a look at the picture just next, but we're gonna see that at this point in time, we've actually already harvested energy from ATP. So we're gonna see the byproducts of taking that energy out of the final bond. We're gonna see ADP, adenosine diphosphate, or like smaller form, along with the phosphate ion that we've pulled off, uh, attached to the myosin at specific binding site, we're gonna see the myosin grabbing onto the actin in this first step. Okay. So what we were looking at is basically right here. So this is where we start our cycle, okay? So here's our first step, okay? So, what we're looking at is just one of our cross bridges in the cross bridge cycle. So our thick filament overall would have many, many myosin all kind of bundled together. So this would be happening in many places at once. Um, but we're focusing in on one. Okay. So on that myosin head, we have a binding site for ATP that has this ATP ACE action that breaks ATP adenosine triphosphate into a phosphate ion plus ADP, right? So ATP is like phosphate, 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 plus the adenosine, it's just gonna be that part, okay? When we break it out to get energy, we rip this bond, giving us adenosine diphosphate, di meaning two, okay? plus a free phosphate ion. So we can see those two products here attached to their binding site on myosin. Um, and during this step, what is happening 
is that the first step is that we have myosin and actin bind together. So we have a binding site for actin, an actin binding site on myosin. And we have a myosin binding site that's centered the olive on actin. And they come together here in this first step. So they're coming together in our first step of the crossbridge cycle. I'm gonna go through one by one. So that's our first step. We have our thick filament myosin bind to the actin. I wanna point out for you some structures on the actin right now. They're gonna come up when we talk about our next little bit excitation contraction coupling. But I want you to note on the actin, okay, actin, so those little globules that are kind of blue threaded together in this double helix structure. Yeah. But we have some regulatory proteins associated. So we have tropomyosin here, that pink kind of spaghetti structure. And we have our troponin complex, this little snowman on top. And we also have a calcium ion. So this is calcium. This is tropomyosin. And that pink snowman is troponin. Right. So this cross bridge cycle is happening right, at our starting point. You can see that this is able to happen because we have calcium bound to troponin. And when calcium is bound to troponin, this pushes the tropomyosin off of these binding sites, off of those myosin binding sites on actin. Right? So at rest, if we're not contracting, or when we don't have calcium, right? that tropomyosin would be here covering over the binding sites. So we wouldn't be able to do any of this. We wouldn't be able to run the crossbridge cycle if we have tropomyosin covering that binding site. It's important to realize that we're set up for this first step of the crossbridge cycle by the presence of calcium and by that exposure of the myosin binding site. Okay, so because it's exposed, myosin and actin can bind together and they do. What happens next after they bind together is that that phosphate ion falls off. So as we bind together, that phosphate ion is released and this changes the shape of the head. When that phosphate ion falls off, this creates a shape, shape change that produces the power stroke. So this is that push of the ore. Okay, so mm -hmm. looking for something to throw. All right, not gonna be a great example. Oh, I can find an eraser. Great. All right. So my hand, my arm, right? My hand here is the head of the myosin. We're starting in this back position. The eraser is the actin, right? So I've grabbed my thin filament. When the phosphate ion falls off, it just flips forward. That's it, right? So you see that change in shape. It's subtle when you're looking at the image, right? But all we've done is change that head shape from being back here flip forward as the phosphate ion um, releases. So as you saw, that through the eraser, this throws the actin towards the center of the sarcomere. So that's what's happening here during the power stroke. So we can see at this point, when we have the power stroke, we've got just ADP in that ATPA site on the myosin head. We're still bound to the actin, but we've created this angle, right? We've gone from uh, this sort of straighter position, right? And we've flicked forward, creating that power stroke, propelling the actin. Okay. So now we have moved the sarcomere, right? At this point, we have already shortened the sarcomere a little bit because we already pulled the actin to the center. But there's a lot left of our cross bridge cycle because we want to do this over and over again, kind of all over the place. So we've got to set up 
to be able to flick that back to again. We got to set up again. So that's what the rest of the cross bridge cycle is really going to be letting us do. Okay. So after our power stroke, so after we flick actin towards the center of our sarcomere, we're now gonna let go of the ADP, right? So we let go of the phosphate ion in order to propel our actin forward. So to flick it forward towards the center of the sarcomere. Now we're also done with the ADP and we're trying to set ourselves back up to do it again. So we're going to want to grab a new ATP molecule, so our new form of cellular energy, and get energy out of it to set us up to do this again. So in order to do that, we got to get rid of the ADP because it doesn't have any, any energy left for us and grab some ATP, which does still have energy in it. Okay, so ADP gets released. And this puts us into a state called rigor. So this is myosin in its low energy form. So we're in the same shape that we ended at the end of the power stroke, right? So we're all the way forward. We don't have uh, anything other than actin bound, right? And imagine my actin, right? I've pushed it forward. Right? I can't push it forward anymore. So rigor is like stiffness, right? Like this is too stiff. There's no way for me to continue pushing that actin if I'm in this shape. Okay. So that's why this is rigor. This is why this is the low energy form of myosin. Okay. So we're setting up to do it again. So now is where we see new ATP binding to the head of myosin. So it's gonna go right where we saw that phosphate ion and ADP at the beginning of the cycle, okay? So as this happens, ATP binds in there. So kind of like where my wrist is when I'm flicking that eraser, right? On that ATP ACE binding site, okay? And when it does that, this causes myosin and actin to separate. So as the ATP binds, we have a slight change in the chemistry here. So the myosin and actin binding point kind of falls apart. Okay. So now we have myosin and actin separate from each other. So I've like let go of the water if we're using the uh, or metaphor or I've like let go of the piece of eraser, right? Grabbing another, right? We're gonna grab another piece. We're gonna grab another piece farther along so that we can continue pulling actin towards the center. So we do that while we pick up this ATP molecule. Okay. Now, in order to actually have energy after grabbing ATP, Right? The reason that ATP works as a cellular form of energy is not just like that we have a nice star symbol and we like star symbols. It's that we can break a bond. We can get energy out of chemical bonds. So we hydrolyze ATP. So hydrolysis is breaking up something with water. There's plenty of water in our cells. Right? So we break up that ATP molecule breaking that final bond between its three phosphate groups, okay? Which leads us to the high energy form of myosin, okay? So in the high energy form of myosin, we have a phosphate ion and ADP bound to that site where we had ATP before, because we split it apart, right? So we cut off a P, that's where that phosphate ion is. The rest is now ADP, adenosine diphosphate, instead of adenosine triphosphate. Okay. What's also happening as we do that, we actually kind of pull the whole arm in, right? So that's what it's talking about when it's talking about cocking of the myosin head, right? So we are actually tucking everything kind of back into the myosin before in step one, as we re regenerate the cycle, go back to the beginning, step one was we reach out and grab the actin. 
So in summary, this is our whole Crossbridge cycle, right? We have actin and myosin ready to grab each other at the beginning because of the presence of calcium and the exposure of their binding sites. At the beginning of the Crossbridge cycle, myosin is in a high energy form right before binding to the actin. And in the high energy form, we have ADP and a phosphate ion attached to the binding site, the ATPA site on myosin. And that's because we've already used that energy to change the shape of myosin to prepare to pull on the actin. Myosin binds to actin. After it does that, the phosphate ion falls off, triggering the power stroke which propels actin and that thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. This shortens the sarcomere. And then the rest of the cycle, so essentially steps three through five are all about setting ourselves back up to grab another chunk of myosin or think about it as a rope, right? You're pulling your arm back to grab further and further up the rope, right? So to do that, we have to get rid of the ADP because it's blocking our ATPA site. Okay. We are in this rigor state now where we have nothing at all bound to that site and we've used the energy from that bond already. So we're gonna grab a new ATP. Okay. Grabbing a new ATP unbinds myosin and actin from each other. So now we've got a space here. We break ATP apart through hydrolysis, so using water present in the environment. This cocks that myosin head into its high energy position. So we're tucked in right here. We've broken the bond in ATP. We've got that energy in the myosin molecule now. And then we start over when we grab another point on the actin and then continue to throw it forward over and over and over again. Okay, so questions now about this Crossbridge cycle. I suspect you will have questions after you look at this for a while, but um, that's that's our conceptual framework for understanding what's going on in the crossbridge cycle. So if you get confused as you're going through the steps, kind of zoom out, think about the purpose of these steps, why each of these things has to happen, um, and then kind of dive back in, because so otherwise, you know, it may seem like you're memorizing a bunch of things that are, are kind of random, but they're not random. Okay, great. We do have a question. Mm, great question. Okay. So what's happening as the sarcomere is shortening, what's actually moving forward is the actin, right? So in our long form of the sarcomere, We've got like, I'm the same Z every time, it's actually kind of hard for me. Okay. So in the long form, the actin is out here. And in the short form, the actin is in here. Okay. But in either case, the myosin kind of doesn't like really have to move. Right, so it's gonna kind of span the same spot. Sorry, I didn't draw my lines all that even, right? But imagine, right, the myosin is what creates the center 
imagine that's where I drew my endpoints, kind of down the same, right? So the center of the sarcomere is where we have our M line. So our M line is here. And that's our M line. So it doesn't have to really move forward. What has to move is the projection of that actin, right? So what's happened now is that those endpoints on the actin are closer to the middle line of the sarcomere, which is defined as the middle of the myosin. So it's the actin that's moving in response to the myosin. All that really is moving with the myosin is its arm kind of throwing over and over again. So their relative positions are changing, but they're changing because the actin Anything else? Okay. I'll keep thinking. Okay. So practice question then. All right. So during this cycle, so during the cross bridge cycle that we just went through. Remind me, what was causing that myosin to pull the actin to the middle of the sarcomere? What was the trigger for that? Let's see how we're doing. Okay, cool. Yeah, so our direct cause, the direct cause for myosin to pull the actin, so to propel that actin towards the center of the sarcomere, is that release of the phosphate ion that causes that shape change in this high energy kind of correct form. The phosphate ion falls off and we flick forward. Okay? So that's happening when the phosphate ion falls off. So spend some time looking at that figure, explaining it to yourself, explaining it to a stuffed animal, explaining it to your dog. Um, go through those steps kind of precisely. Try and think about why each of these steps is happening. And okay. you're gonna wanna, wanna practice. Okay. So we're gonna begin our next topic. So we're still thinking about muscle contraction. Okay? But now we're thinking about why is the cross bridge cycle starting? Right? So we know in general, we have our neuromuscular junction, we have a motor nerve coming in to our muscle fiber. We know that the way that we're going to create contraction is we're shortening the sarcomere. Now we know that the mechanism for that shortening is the cross bridge cycle, which sets up using ATP and pulls actin towards the center of the sarcomere, shortening it. Okay. We know how we set up for that and then how we actually do it through shape changes in myosin. Now we wanna think about, okay, but sometimes your muscles are contracting, sometimes they're not contracting. How do we turn that cross bridge cycle on and off? So we're not just like kind of stuck in a fully contracted position all the time, okay? And this is where we think about that calcium. So that's why I was pointing out to you that initial state of the actin with the tropomyosin off the myosin binding sites on the actin because of that binding of calcium into troponin because creating that state is necessary to allow actin and myosin to bind to each other at all. Okay. So we're gonna have a sequence of events 
coming from our motor neuron and its action potential, releasing acetylcholine, being received by the nicotinic cholinergic receptors on the muscle fiber, and then creating an action potential within the muscle fiber itself, releasing calcium into the cytoplasm, essentially in that muscle fiber, sarcoplasm. Uh, once we have calcium there, we can start the cross bridge cycle because it makes that change to the relative position of the actin and the tropomyosin. So we're gonna step through. So we're thinking about how these muscle contractions get turned on and off. So overall, in this list, we've already had that neuron side stuff happen. So our motor neuron has already had its own action potential, gotten to the terminal bouton, which is just our renamed axon terminal. It's released its neurotransmitter. We've received it, okay? So this is starting on the muscle fiber side, talking about the reaction in the muscle fiber to that excitatory potential in the muscle. Okay. So in reaction to that neurotransmitter, we opened up an ion channel. On net, we had a bunch of sodium flow in. When we have positive charges flow into the cell, that means our membrane potential goes up. That is by definition a depolarization because right, we started out negative, we're getting more positive, okay? And depolarizations cause action potentials once they hit a certain threshold in our neurons and in our muscles, it's still happening. We're not gonna be looking at a graph and arc of uh, the exact steps of an action potential in muscles. That's, that's not necessary here. What we're gonna be thinking about is why that action potential releases calcium. So how that's happening. So what's going on here, and we'll see a picture later, but fundamentally, we've got our sarcolemma is our plasma membrane of our muscle cell. Okay? And we saw that there were some different structures in our muscle fibers, right? So we saw our triad made of a T-tubule shooting down into our muscle fiber. And we had our lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum kind of on either side of that T-tubule. So this is our, our structure kind of along the membrane and then diving into our cell. Okay. So for step one, um, so for step one, where we have our nerve coming in and zapping our muscle fiber with its nice, nice acetylcholine, we create an action potential across the sarcolemma. So we're saying we're letting sodium ions in on net, creating changes in charge. That change in charge spreads out down the sarcolemma. So that has the direction to it along the plasma membrane. Then the action potential continues going down the T-tubule. So we're like diving into the cell with that action potential. Okay. As that action potential dives down the T-tubule, the T-tubule itself has receptors that open. Okay. So the T-tubule has receptors that know there's an action potential and there are calcium channels and additional receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when we see that depolarization, there's a reaction in the T-tubule with these DHP receptors that tells these lateral sacs of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release their calcium. They've been storing calcium. So that's why we have it there. So this releases calcium ions into the cytosol. Once they're in the cytosol, they bind to troponin. So troponin essentially has a binding site for the calcium. It reacts with the calcium. That was that little snowman sitting on top of our actin. Okay? So when we have calcium 
increasing in the cytosol, we have more calcium touching troponin. So as it binds to a troponin, troponin pushes on tropomyosin. That was that long pink spaghetti thread on the actin that's been covering up the myosin binding sites on the actin. So now those myosin binding sites are exposed. And once they're exposed, the myosin binding site on the actin can touch the actin binding site on the myosin, starting our cross bridge cycle. So that's how we get from a nervous impulse coming down our motor neuron to actually doing our cross bridge cycle inside our muscle fiber cell, creating this contraction in the sarcomere. So we have that written out in a figure from your book, right? So here we're just zooming in. It's describing what we've already talked about at our neuromuscular junction. So we have that acetylcholine release from our motor neuron binding to those acetylcholine cholinergic receptors on that motor end plate. This creates an end plate potential, which is just an action potential, really. Action potential in the muscle fiber cell is continuing propagating down that plasma membrane called the sarcolemma, continues down into our T-tubule. In that T-tubule, we've got some receptors that ultimately trigger calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then we have contraction because that calcium touches our troponin, pushing off that tropomyosin, exposing those myosin binding sites so our cross bridge cycle can begin. Okay. Now we do eventually have muscles relax. Okay. So after we shorten the muscle fiber, we'll want to allow it to lengthen again. We don't have action potentials that repolarize or anything. They're always depolarization. So this is a process that's just going to happen within the cell without any signal from the nerve, really. Okay. So what happens is that calcium just gets basically reabsorbed. So it goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which means the actin tropomyosin and troponin all go back to their original states with those binding sites locked. Okay. Well, and here, that's pretty much what we're gonna get. 